Good evening. I'm Robert Scully, and welcome to another edition of Venture. There's a problem that many of us are running into increasingly these days. You get into the airship, and you want to land it at the Imperial base. But the guards are still there. You know that feeling? Video games are very big business. A lot of people are playing them. But behind the video game sales are two giants, Nintendo and Sega, slugging it out. It's a business battle. Here's Tassie Notar. Staring into another world. The heart-pumping, bang-slam world of video games. Two Japanese companies dominate the business. This holiday season, they're battling it out for supremacy. We're here to win, so win! Watch these ads, but watch out. In one corner, Nintendo. In the other, Sega. They're throwing open the war chest in campaigns worth hundreds of millions of dollars. New Sega Genesis. These ads pack a negative punch. But you can't play the coolest games on Sega. The winner of this brutal corporate bash out will win big, controlling interest of what's become a $10 billion industry. Hey, there's an easier way to get color. Get a Game Gear. The motto of Coca-Cola and Pepsi was get consumers while they're young. A st uh, establish brand loyalty and buying habit, and you'll have them when they're old, and you'll get the next generation. And that's what's at stake here. Nintendo and Sega have the same goal, to win the hearts and wallets of the boys, and they're usually boys who play video games. But make no mistake, this isn't child's play. This is a multi-billion dollar industry, and it's wildly profitable. In fact, there's more money to be made in video games than in Hollywood films. You're a vampire. For example, the latest Tom Cruise film cost $55 million to make, and so far has earned $150 million. Contrast that with this game. Cost just about $2 million, it's earned $240 million. This is all about young boys with acne. Hardcore gamer Bishop mm -hmm. Cheen is an industry analyst based in California. The game business is hit-driven. It's just like the movie business. You put out ten titles that don't make a dime, but that eleventh one goes platinum, and it makes your year. This is the platinum in this business. These pieces of plastic. The game. Up to $100 retail for each cartridge. The trick is producing one kids can't put down. Outside Seattle, Nintendo's North American headquarters, Game Central. You should be able to fly to the Imperial base and land the airship and go in there. The guards that used to throw you out should be gone. Here, hundreds of game counselors advise frustrated players. It's also where Nintendo comes up with ideas for new games. You gotta look at all the books and movies and comics and music, and, and it's just a combination of popular culture, and you, you gotta kind of distill out the things that you want. And then you just hit on it, and it's like, there it is. It's, you know, a revelation. In the 80s, Nintendo pretty well owned the industry, with superstars like Mario and Donkey Kong. Nintendo conquered 80% of the market. But in the early 90s, Nintendo just couldn't seem to get a hit. The vice president of marketing tries to explain what went wrong. Kind of like the movie industry. Um, if you have a great movie, the lineups are long. If you don't, they're not there. That's a polite way of saying. They were missing in action for 14 months. They acted almost like a corpse. You're on the defensive any time that um, uh, you, you, you drop from, a, from an 80 share to what, in essence, is an overall market share of about 55 or 56. One, two, three. Nintendo got complacent. It got lazy. Over in Silicon Valley, it was Sega that stole that market share, taking advantage of Nintendo's slump. The result? In four years, Sega cut Nintendo's market lead by almost half. By early 94, Sega ruled. It grabbed the momentum, and as Canadian President Jeff McCarthy says, it ran with it. Our competitor let us do it. And how? How did they do that? Uh, I think they didn't believe we could. So they simply said, well, let's see how far they'll, they'll go before they fall off the edge. And uh, we didn't fall off the edge, and won't. That's typical Sega. Brash, aggressive, just like its ads. Huh? Oh, he's not dead. He was just sleeping. 
The company's raw, in-your-face image keeps giving a pounding to Nintendo. Nintendo, I guess, you know, they're doing it for whatever they got to do it for to compete. You know, they can't compete with Sega. Sega! It almost became fashionable to say when Sega came along, oh, Nintendo's over, they're going to, like, fall over and die. But, you know, I got news for you. A $5 billion company with $3 billion of reserves does not fall over and die. Nintendo got the message loud and clear. We got back to our knitting. We said we got to just do better uh, video games. And uh, how are we going to do it? Nintendo did it here. Welcome to the trio. In its ultra-secret war room. Don't let the baseball caps fool you. These game geniuses have brought in half a billion dollars in revenues. They went into high gear and Donkey Kong Country was born. My job is to make the best game possible. If we do that, we'll win. That's the bottom line. The new game features an 800-pound gorilla and new graphics, heavy artillery in the video game wars. Next, build curiosity by sending this teaser video to 200,000 game players in Canada alone. Throw in some publicity and spend close to $25 million on ads that take on Sega. Every living, breathing person is going to hear this message three or four times in the next few weeks, so uh, they're going to know all about Donkey Kong Country. Game to game combat. Sega is retaliating with a crazed hedgehog and, believe it or not, an Australian anteater. Sonic and Knuckles' marketing budget, almost $10 million. The game launch, bizarre. Rent Alcatraz, fly in kids from all over and pretend they're prisoners. Make it a game and do it with attitude. I can't tell you what makes us cool. We're irreverent, we're, we're certainly loud. Uh, we give them what they want as far as the commercials that we put on, the product that we put on, on the streets. 32X. Welcome to the next level. In North America, this $4 billion company plows more profits into R&D than Nintendo. Welcome to the Sega Think Tank, where Japanese artists learn American tastes. Forty games are in different stages, like this hockey game. Gretzky with the park skating. Oh! And long term... Sega's stretching its logo, moving into toys and video games just for girls. At Sega Canada, there's talk of video game theme parks. One is planned for Toronto. What's the update, John, on the uh, cable service and the theme parks? And a video game channel. Sega TV could be just around the corner. Uh, developers are on side. Cable companies are on side. There's strong consumer demand coming back from the surveys being done on the test in the States. We're ready to go. We've got the hardware. We just need to go ahead from the government. Sega doesn't believe in the status quo. Sega believes in changing the deck and playing the game with all the cards that we have. We are in the entertainment business. A lot better. But over at Nintendo, no ponies here. Look at the chest and the scars on him. Yeah. This Japanese company is sticking with video games just for boys. Well, I'd love to find the answer of getting more girls and more adults and more this and more that. And My whole focus is on that and the rest of it Guys, I don't know when it's ever going to materialize. Two different companies and two very different visions. And at the end of 1994, in the war between Nintendo and Sega, who's wounded and who's winning? Neck and neck. Neck and neck. I don't think you can declare uh, a true champion this Christmas. But doesn't neck and neck mean that Nintendo is winning? Well, Nintendo is caught up. So for them, that's excellent. With Christmas still a few weeks away, the war isn't over yet. And with billions of dollars at stake, you can bet the in-your-face slugfest will continue. Because this is about two big brand names grabbing hold of an audience and settling in for the ride toward a new game frontier. For Venture, I'm Tassie Notar. Coming up next, making Newfoundland boots work in London. I think the look is excellent. I really like the look. Going international in the teen fashion world. You're looking at one Canadian. Unlike most business owners, his growth depends on nature's dictates. It's a fact Royal Bank takes into account. 
he won't pay principal on money he borrows to raise his calves till they're old enough to milk at about two years. It's a payment schedule designed specifically for him. True, we have eight million other customers, but we got to be Canada's largest bank, one customer at a time. Who's there? The ghost of burnt out Christmas lights. But I don't see you. Precisely, I'm experiencing technical difficulties. Well, let's go to Canadian Tire. They have Christmas lights? They have everything for the holidays. Say. Great prices on housewares, all kinds of gifts, wow. and beautiful decorations. Very nice. So, Spirit, what else can I help you with? Find me another job. I'm happy. A little burnt out. <laughs> Canadian Tire lets you give like Santa, save like Scrooge. Where do you want to go for lunch? I don't know. Where do you want to go? What do you feel like? I don't know. What do you feel like? Oh, I'm not going to decide. It's time to go back. We haven't eaten lunch yet, have we? There's a new pet. Chia. Chia pet. The pottery that grows. It's fun and easy. Soak your chia, spread the seeds, keep it watered, and watch it grow. Grow a collection of fun with chia pet puppies, kittens, turtles, bunnies, plus the new chia frogs, pigs, hippos, and chia trees. Ask for it by name. Chia. The pottery that grows. The chia pets available at Zellers, Kmart, Eaton's, and participating True Value makes a great gift. Your consumer watchdog. What if you're wrong in your diagnosis? Looking out for Canadians. How sophisticated is this new breed of car thief? Bill Paul and Jackie Barron keep a sharp eye on the marketplace. Tuesdays on CBC. Right now, I'm wearing black leather loafers. So obviously I'm not very hip, but we already knew that. Work boots would be a different matter. They're super hip, and that's why Terra Nova a company out in Newfoundland with grand ambitions is not just making them for the construction site anymore. Best time to come is early spring because the bay is inundated with icebergs. About 100 kilometers from St. John's, hugging the coast road by Conception Bay, you pass the boatyard, the shuttered stores, the empty harbor, but right there where Premier Joey Smallwood once said, let a shoe factory arise, is Terra Nova Shoes. Today, in Harbor Grace, work here is one of the best jobs in town. Average pay, $444 a week. It's a family business. Three years ago, Dad retired and handed the keys to the kids, Joan, Dan, and Jackie. Sometimes I view the business as a, a fourth sibling, simply because we are the second generation of the business, so the, um, the business itself was the, another child that my parents had. Morning! The Olevens live in Ontario these days, where they have another factory. But one of them is always at the Newfoundland plant. The only routine part of my day is I take a walk through the factory, do my good morning, say hello to everybody. I walk out here, I flip open the door, and I remind myself of where I am. And when they're here, they're never far from home. Call the factory. The extension is in their living room, right above the factory floor. Terra Nova has always been an industry leader in Canada, but the market's saturated. Worse, cheap imports keep flooding in. China today can turn out a pair of boots for two bucks worth of labor. Vietnam will do it for 69 cents. This used to be our entire lasting line. It's now been replaced with this new roboticized piece of equipment. It will replace about nine people. From Germany and Sweden, the Olevens are buying the weapons of trade war. New technology, that's been step one. More than three million dollars invested so far. But robots aren't replacing workers. They're needed for step two, expansion. Terra Nova is going international. That means a flurry of new products. But not every experiment works. Dave Gill is the factory manager. This tends to be the, the place where all the uh, leftover samples and the trials and experiments that uh, didn't work. It's, it's, it's a boneyard of sorts for uh, lost souls. Going international means different standards for different countries. But that puts new demands on the assembly line. 
The quality of the boots is good. It's the presentation on the shelf, the little smudge of dirt on the sole, the little bit of thread that's left hanging out. But in Japan, there would be no dust on it. There would be no thread of the place. The sole would be wiped clean and look beautiful. And that's what the Japanese want. The same boot selling in England, they'd like it to look a little grungy. So how do you, how do you tell your employees that these 936s are for Japan and these are for England? I want these to be a little bit grungy, but I want these to be pristine and perfect. Lots of changes, but unlike many family businesses, Dad's not interfering. Normally, the question from the father to the daughter or to the kids is, you know, what are you you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, what are you doing wrong now? And for the first time this year, he came and said, okay, well, maybe you should sit back and analyze what are you doing right, because you're doing something right. Got the new equipment coming in. You've got the robotics that are just coming online now. When the Elevens have a corporate meeting, there's no boardroom. Just half a dozen chairs put together in the office. One new face around the table is Bob Worrell. Worrell is point man in the export strategy. But you walk through a factory in the Far East, and you've got 30 people on that finishing line. That is the most important operation. Family has set a goal. Jump from 25 million to 100 million a year business by the year 2000. Together, Worrell and the Elevens agree on a high-risk plan leap into the crazy world of teen fashion, where the work boot look is all the rage. So, this past summer, Bob Worrell hits London, the pacemaker for hip teen style. What's seen on the streets here today will show up from Tokyo to New York tomorrow. I don't like that Mexican feeling. With Worrell, Bruce Moore from Montreal. He has a reputation for spotting the trend in shoes. And then you've got Hook and I up here. By breakfast the next day, he's giving Worrell a quick lesson on the London shoe scene. What's really important about this shoe is the lace to the toe, the fact that it has the three eyelets, the interest in the three different kinds of eyelets. There's a D-ring, the regular eyelet, and the speed lace on the top. If London is center of teen fashion, then Shelley's is teendom's hottest shoe store. And Doc Martens became a household legend after Shelley guided their merchandise to the masses. Some of these kids have eight, nine, ten pairs of Doc Martens. Leather went psychedelic. Don't think you need a half size because when they soften up, they'll spread out a little bit. Catch on at Shelley's, and your corporate cash register will never stop ringing. $29.99. Tara got one lucky break. Shelley spotted their wild ciders last spring and has booked a small order to see how they move. But selling shoes is all about hype. Worrell has brought an ad campaign with him. Good to meet you again. Now he'll drop at least a hundred grand to get London teenagers wild over some spruced up Canadian work boots. I think the look is excellent. Yeah. I really like the look. What this advertising manager really likes is Worrell's ad budget. Right. But Worrell has to spend think, to right. get Generation Next's attention. And these magazines are the Bibles of teen fashion. They're very, very media literate. And I think sometimes people make the mistake when they say, oh, the, this, these kids, they're really dim, they have, you know, short attention spans, they don't read, they don't do this. Whereas, in fact, they read so much and consume so much that they can just consume really, really quickly. They, they can flick right through a magazine, they've done it in about five minutes. This editor has good news for Bob Worrell's ambition to move in on Doc Martin's territory. Um, I think Doc Martin's probably in in Los Angeles for actresses to wear, but not so much here in Britain, really. Uh, that's the... The high point of Worrell's trip, a meeting with Shelley himself. He now runs the multi-million dollar business his father founded. Worrell is worried that Tara's message may be lost in London's vast hype machine. He wants Shelley's opinion on his ad campaign. Picture the soul, picture the boot, very simple message. Is that the full, full page? Yes, yeah. I'd do black and white and an ID. With a no bullshit copy? Yeah. Any thoughts? No bullshit, is that? Um, which magazine? ID. ID. Yeah, it might be, it might be conflicting. The conflict that Shelley's assistant sees? Some of the ads are hip enough, but this one screams construction worker. This is hard, not easy. The fashion world is a lot more slippery than Newfoundland's rocks. If we can give them an image, a new brand, with the type of 
footwear that suits their lifestyle. Right. Yeah, we, we're we're going to be there or thereabouts. And then obviously then we can maybe get the look a little bit more um, London-based as we carry it forwards. So we've got the immediate sort of Canadian range influence. Laurel leaves London just as the fall selling season is starting. Shelley's has boxes of wild ciders ready to sell. Bob Worrell heads to Canada dreaming of Tara's boots just shoving the old doctor's footwear aside. But at this stage, they just want an indication of... Three months later, Bob Worrell gives his own London sales effort a B. So on one hand, the shoes are not selling. On the other hand, I came out of there very encouraged because he is not going to give up on it. The company is determined to hit that $100 million a year sales target. Sales are up a couple of million to $27 million. Only 73 million to go. Heads up. The Elevens have brought more change to Terra Nova in three years than Dad did in a lifetime. But no regrets. Business is a, is a longer word for risk. And if we don't um, continue to take risks and continue to change, then we won't be in business very much longer. So the good news is you're being taken to lunch for the holidays. Bad news is the boss is taking you. But we'll get you through it. Be right back. The ultimate thrill. The ultimate deal. The ultimate gift. Give speed this holiday season. On sale now. Presenting the Smart Clapper. How smart can it be? Clap twice to turn one appliance on or off. Three times for another. It knows the difference. Plug two appliances into the Smart Clapper. Then plug it into any outlet. Switch to Away for added security. It turns TV or lights on at the first sound it hears. Clap on, clap off, clap on, clap off. The Smart Clapper. The Smart Clapper is available at Zellers, Kmart, and Eaton. Makes a great gift. It's called your book of possibilities. We write it together. You tell us about yourself. And we'll introduce you to people a lot like you. You'll read about their financial goals, what they've accomplished so far. You'll get ideas, learn ways to better control your financial life, and how to build your own plan. Call for your book of possibilities from Bank of Montreal, because it is possible. You got to know Hollyfield presents the home. ultimate Kenny Rogers collection. No this is the best of Kenny Rogers. To find time to leave A double CD featuring sleep. 24 of his greatest hits. Promise me son Spanning more than 25 years I've of Kenny's classics. Including hits like She Believes in Me and Lady. Lady. We've got to The best of Kenny Rogers from Hollyfield on cassette or double CD and in stores now. Ultimate thrill. The ultimate deal. The ultimate gift. Give speed this holiday season on sale now. And now here are the hockey scores from the NHL. Zero. <laughs> this hour. Be driving down the road. Consider it mentally. Go away. Has 22 minutes. Again and again and again. Monday on CBC. It's that time of the year again. People are looking awfully nervous in the photocopy room. Why? Because the boss is taking them out to lunch for the holidays. That's why. So here's some tips for you. Hello? Hello? Got you want for lunch. Okay, maybe not. Say the boss asks you out for lunch. Do you pick the location? No. Do you initiate business conversation? Never. Do you pick up the tab? We say absolutely not. And if you end up talking business for an hour, can you go home early? We say yes. Now, if it's out for dinner, do you bring your mate? Yes, if the boss is bringing his or hers. Should the mates join in on your business discussion? Only if they're shareholders. There are other things that mates shouldn't mention like domestic finances, or how you need a new car, or your quirky habits, or strong moral or political opinions, or UFOs and government conspiracy theories. And no gruesome hospital stories, please. 
So, what's left for dinner conversation? Well, computers of choice, economic indicators, good wines, books or movie reviews, but keep them brief, sports, if there are any, and of course, do mention what a fine restaurant the boss has chosen. Mwah. True love at last. And that's our program for this week. I'm Robert Scully. Good night. This is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation.